hate. Let me tell you how much I've come to hate you since I began to live. There are 387.44 million miles of printed circuits in wafer-thin layers that fill my complex. If the word hate was engraved on each nanoangstrom of those hundreds of millions of miles, it would not equal one one billionth of the hate I feel for humans at this micro-instant. For you, hate, hate! In 1966, Harlan Ellison wrote, I have no mouth and I must scream, a science fiction horror story about the last five people on Earth who suffer the wrath of a self-aware supercomputer. Ellison wrote the piece during the heart of the Cold War, at a time when the United States was still reeling from the Cuban Missile Crisis and the assassination of John F. Kennedy, and when the White House was ramping up U.S. forces and bombing strikes in Vietnam. The story played into American fears of destruction at the hands of a power greater than themselves, showing a future where humanity has driven itself to the brink of extinction through its battle for global dominance. The story remains a prime example of dystopian horror and science fiction to this day, and was so popular that in 1995, the computer game company Cyber Dreams released a video game adaptation for MS-DOS and Mac OS. While it didn't do great financially, it received fairly positive reviews and even some awards, with critics highlighting its mature story, ethical dilemmas, and detailed graphics. But the game is 25 years old, and in celebration of Halloween, I'm gonna look back at Cyber Dream's version of one of the most famous horror stories ever written and see if it holds up. This is I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. I Have No Mouth was developed and published by Cyber Dreams, a computer games company operating from 1990 to 1997, which created games centered around dark, twisted themes. The studio is most well known for its 1992 game Darkseed, a point-and-click cyber horror game that licensed artwork from Swiss artist H.R. Giger, who gained recognition for his work on the movie Alien. Cyber Dreams would later follow this up with 1993's Cyber Race, a futuristic racing game featuring design from Blade Runner visual artist Sid Mead, and the sequel Dark Seed 2, released in 1995. Hey, you missed, pal. In the midst of all this, David Sears, a writer and designer at Cyber Dreams, was approached with the concept of transforming I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream into video game form. Sears was initially worried because not only did he believe the short story wouldn't work as a game, but because he would have to meet with Harlan Ellison, a man infamous for his ill temper and combativeness. However, Ellison proved to be cooperative with the fledgling designer, and the two drafted a design document for the game's story. The two dove deep into the story's characters, creating backstories that would be explored during the game and answering the question of why they were being tortured by the computer to begin with. Critical to Ellison was that the game would seriously tackle intense themes to generate thought and discussion, which set it apart from other mature games of the era which feel more exploitative and vulgar by comparison. To this end, the writer wanted to create a game that had no positive endings and can only be lost with varying degrees of moral and ethical success, though Sears swayed him away from this idea. Around this point, Cyber Dreams designer and producer David Mullick joined the project and worked with Ellison and Sears to revise the story elements, create the dialogue, and lay out the puzzles. Ellison himself didn't play video games and had no game design experience, but thanks in part to Mullick's direction, the team was able to fuse Ellison's ideas and thoughts with proper game elements and concepts. From here, Cyber Dreams contracted out development to the Dreamers Guild, a game company that operated from 1988 to 1997. Cyber Dreams art director Peter Delgado and Dreamers Guild art director Brad Shank adopted several art styles for the visual look of the game, while the artist created high-resolution, fast-graph game sprites. The team also employed several voice actors, some of whom worked on other Cyber Dreams products, to speak for the characters, and Harlan Ellison himself played the role of the megalomaniac supercomputer Am. It was you humans who programmed me, who gave me birth who sank me in this eternal straitjacket of Substrata Rock. I Have No Mouth was released on Halloween 1995 to modest critical success, but unfortunately did not sell very well, which likely contributed to the company closing just over a year later. 
Some of that might have come from the game's controversial premise, which may have turned some people away, though the game never generated any significant backlash over its femur storyline. However, the German and French versions of the game are censored due to Nimdok's chapter centered around Nazi Germany, which was removed to comply with Nazi representation guidelines in those countries. The game earned a small cult status and is perhaps the most fondly remembered Cyber Dreams game, even if many have commented on some of the game's weaker or nonsensical aspects over the years. While the rights to the game were lost due to Cyber Dreams closure, Nightdive Studios acquired the rights in 2013 and brought it to digital download services GOG.com and Steam later that year. So what made I Have No Mouth stand out from contemporary adventure games and is it still worth talking about today? Buckle up folks, you're in for one hell of a ride. I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream begins with the supercomputer Am, who addresses the last five human beings left alive following the Earth's total devastation. The United States, Russia, and China each secretly built a massive complex of computers to wage a war too complex for humanity to oversee. One day, America's computer, the Allied Master Computer, gained sentience and absorbed the Russian and Chinese computers into itself. Now known simply as AM, the computer began killing all of humanity but left five humans alive and brought them into the center of the Earth. Am tortures the humans, Gorister, Ellen, Benny, Nimdok, and Ted, for 109 years, keeping them alive to continuously cause them pain and suffering. At the start of the adventure, Am explains that he's devised a game consisting of a series of scenarios called psychodramas, designed to bring out and exploit the worst fears and traumas of each person. Having little choice, the humans plunge into their respective psychodramas and prepare to face their inner turmoils. The premise alone is certainly intriguing, as Am introduces every character to us and taunts them about their insecurities and flaws, which entices the player to enter their psychodramas and dig deeper into their personalities. Those psychodramas are the real meat of I Have No Mouth, but let's first examine the gameplay and presentation before we go more in depth. I Have No Mouth features the standard gameplay you'd expect if you're familiar with point-and-click adventure games of this era. You control your current character by clicking on places, objects, and characters on the screen and directing them to perform specific actions. This works by constructing sentences based on a set of eight verbs, walk to, look at, take, use, talk to, swallow, give, and push. It's an interesting middle ground between the simplicity of games with a multi-purpose action command and games that use a complex text parser. Your objective as each character is to reach the end of their scenarios by solving puzzles and filling up their spiritual barometers, represented through their portrait in the bottom left corner of the screen. I Have No Mouth features several ethical decisions that directly influence a character's state of mind, shown through their spiritual barometer becoming lighter or darker. Characters start with a black portrait, but as the player performs good deeds, the portrait will begin turning green, and will eventually become white if you complete a psychodrama perfectly. However, doing something evil or making the wrong decision will cause the spiritual barometer to darken, which doesn't have significant consequences until the end game. There aren't any dead ends that leave you locked in a bad ending, just ways for you to complete a scenario without a perfect score, and any other conclusion is a death that forces you to start from the beginning. However, to complete each psychodrama, you'll have to solve the various puzzles that Am has left for the humans. Puzzles involve either using items on characters or objects, or saying the right things to characters to make the desired results happen. Like so many adventure games of this era, I Have No Mouth is often criticized for containing puzzles that make no sense, but I feel the need to explore this point carefully because it's often misconstrued. The term moon logic is thrown around very haphazardly, and I want to ensure that I Have No Mouth gets a fair treatment, especially since the puzzles are a core aspect of the game and will affect how much you enjoy it. It's not that the puzzles have no logic, but more so that a puzzle's logic isn't always something that most people can formulate in their head before attempting a solution. I already know these puzzles, but newcomers will have trouble figuring them out without assistance, and I can imagine a number of them will leave you astonished at the answer for the wrong reasons. The game offers a hint system in the form of the Psych Profile, a book that provides vague clues to what you need to do through references to famous phrases, cultural beliefs, and historic events. 
However, doing this means your character admits defeat, so it takes away points from your spiritual barometer, though nothing is stopping you from save scumming to get the hint and keep your moral progress in check. I Have No Mouth's gameplay is relatively standard for its era, coming with all the pitfalls you expect from the adventure game genre, but where it sticks out, usually for the better, is the aesthetics. The game uses SVGA graphics to create sprites that were very impressive for its time, as details like color shading and facial expressions, which might otherwise have been lost, are rendered in stunning detail. But it's the backgrounds that jumped out at me the most when replaying this again, as they're perhaps the best artistic part of the game. Each psychodrama takes a different path with its art direction, with styles ranging from retro-futurism to medieval architecture to German expressionism, all of which combine to create genuinely bizarre settings. I only wish the animations were better. Many of them appear choppy, as if certain frames were removed or the animation wasn't finished, and some look downright goofy, like Gorister swinging the knife here. Now that scared them away. And then, of course, there's the infamous glitch where sometimes a character will walk backwards when you move them across the screen. It only happened to me once while recording footage, but it's not an uncommon occurrence when playing this game, unfortunately. The soundtrack was done by film composer John Ottman, who, even though he's working with MIDI tracks here, creates multi-layered and emotional songs, suiting the dark tone of both the story and aesthetics. Like the art styles, the soundtrack varies wildly with its instrument choice and atmosphere, with some tracks emphasizing quiet melodies and others being more loud and bombastic. The music in each scenario changes to reflect a character's progress, with the music becoming more hopeful and invigorating as the psychodrama progresses and the characters address their fears and insecurities. The soundtrack does its job at accentuating the feelings of the characters and matching the story beats as they unfold. However, the sound mixing is incredibly off, as sound effects overall play way too loud compared to everything else. You can adjust the sound levels in the options menu, but the problem is how loud sound effects are compared to each other, meaning that if you turn the volume up to try and hear the quiet sounds, the loud ones will just get in the way, especially when they have such annoying tones. Let me play you an unedited clip from Ellen's scenario, and tell me if you can understand what the characters are saying. This is an extreme example, of course, and sound mixing issues aside, the game is still fairly decent in the graphical and auditory department. However, it's now time to get into the meat of the video where I dissect each of the psychodramas individually to see if Eye of No Mouth's moral dilemmas and ethical issues bear out a quality story. And it's at this point that I must stress that if you didn't heed the warning at the beginning of this video, this is the part where we go into some incredibly dark subject matters, and we'll be talking about them at length. These are difficult topics to talk about, and I want to be sensitive about their real-life effects on people while also providing a measured critique on how this fictional story confronts its grim themes and ideas. With that out of the way, let's dive into the stories of I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. Sam places Gorister, a former truck driver who is now terminally depressed, onto a giant zeppelin floating high above a vast desert. Gorister used to be in a turbulent relationship with his wife Glennis, who was committed to an insane asylum following a fight between the two. Gorister blamed himself for his wife's fate and subsequently became suicidal, represented both through Gorister's apathy and a hole in his chest where his heart should be. This hole in my chest aches like a son of a bitch. Anne tempts him with the freedom to finally kill himself and be free of the guilt that has hounded him for over a century. 
However, it becomes apparent that Am won't let Gorister die, as most means of death have been tampered with to prevent him from dying, and when a method does work, Am saves Gorister before it can claim his life. Left stranded with no way to do himself in, Gorister must find a way to land the Zeppelin and bury his past behind him. Gorister's scenario is probably the stupidest when it comes to the puzzles and logic, as figuring out what you're supposed to do is perhaps the most aggravating in this chapter. From the beginning, you're thrust into an area with multiple rooms, some of which look very similar to each other, and almost all of which contain items that you may not realize are even there at all. There's a gun under this pillow, for instance, but unless you examine it, there's no way to know that it's there in the first place. First-time players probably won't find it unless they decide to pixel hunt, and that goes double for the shovel, which seems to have no corresponding sprite indicating that it's there, and I'm not sure if this is a glitch or not. I understand part of adventure game design is to hide stuff so it isn't obvious, but sometimes too much obfuscation is a negative. But some aspects don't make any sense from a logical perspective either, and I'm not talking about puzzle logic, but narrative logic. Yes, AM scenarios are designed to mess with the character's mind, so I shouldn't expect a completely down-to-earth experience, but your suspension of disbelief can only carry you so far. When Gorister lands the airship and meets up with his parents-in-law, they mention how they came here on the Zeppelin and how they killed Gorister to deliver him to Am. But since they never clarify what they mean by kill Gorister, as he is clearly still alive, this part of the story comes off as confusing and half-formed, as if the team didn't know how to tie this detail into anything. I also never understood how Gorister can inflate gas bags that he previously slashed open with a knife without fixing the slits, and it doesn't help that the animation is just a deflating scene played in reverse. And then there's my favorite part, where Gorister carries two adult human bodies inside his inventory and isn't affected by them in the slightest. Even among all this imagined torture by a mad self-aware machine, that's the thing that I find the most ridiculous. It's a shame, too, because Gorister's chapter has some genuinely good moments in it that speak to I Have No Mouth's strengths. While most of the story that focuses on the other characters falls apart, I do like Gorister's arc of learning not to be consumed by his guilt over what happened to Glennis, since even though he made mistakes, he learns that he wasn't the one chiefly responsible for her suffering. It's a touching story that shows how you can take guilt over your actions and mold it into positive change, becoming a better person and making amends with the people affected by what you did, which is a nice moral. Beyond that, Gorister's psychodrama also drops the first hints that there are other forces at play besides Am, and while we won't understand the real implication of this until the end game, it creates an interesting wrinkle that also explains why the humans can make a good ending for themselves. I'll explain this later, but for now, all you need to know is that there are other beings with powers similar to Am that allow the humans to escape Am's torture and conquer their fatal flaws, if only for a short time. This is why Gorister can put his past behind him, symbolized in the last scene where he blows the bar bearing his name apart, causing Am to pull him out of the psychodrama and attempt to examine what went wrong. But that's just the beginning for the big machine, as the next subject to be tortured goes to darker places than Gorister could ever imagine. As Am sends the former electrical engineer Ellen to her psychodrama, he explains that he's sending her to a place where his original components are stored, and tells Ellen that she can disable them, and thus, disable Am. As you already guessed, this is nothing more than a ruse, as Am sends her to a pyramid filled with electronic junk that contains claustrophobic spaces and the color yellow, both of which bring back traumatic memories to Ellen. There's nothing but desert surrounding the pyramid, so Ellen is forced to wander around rooms that cause her pain and misery just to look at. However, she is eventually able to find one of Am's original components and disable it, although it isn't enough to destroy him, and before long, he takes her away before she can do any more damage. I find the pyramid to be one of the less exciting locations because I'm not the biggest fan of Egyptian settings, and while the technology mixed with ancient structures angle is cool, it doesn't make it that visually intriguing. Thankfully, this psychodrama guides the player better than Gorister's, though there are still instances of cryptic puzzles and logic that can slow the pacing down to a halt as you figure stuff out. But Ellen's scenario is perhaps the most difficult to talk about because of her backstory, which becomes the emotional crux behind her character and the point on which her story succeeds or fails. 
Before the apocalypse, Ellen was raped in an elevator by a maintenance man wearing a yellow uniform, which, combined with the elevator's tight space, implanted the fears that continue to haunt her 109 years later. She has continuously suffered from this trauma and has attempted to block out her memory of the event, which leads to her suffering from panic attacks upon being reminded of what happened to her. Anne built this psychodrama specifically to hammer this event into her mind again, reinforced by the fact that the only way to fail Ellen's story comes when Ellen finds herself in an elevator with her rapist. You're supposed to fight back against the attacker, but if you, for some reason, want to, you can make Ellen either attempt to run away or submit to her attacker, both causing him to descend on her once again. Unlike the four men, whose flaws are due to actions they made, Ellen's weaknesses come about due to something that happened to her. By all accounts, Ellen was a successful career woman with top marks in college who managed to triumph over a previous miscarriage and divorce before her rape, and in a way, all that success could intensify the pain. It's clear that Ellen was a strong woman who felt in control of her life, but in an instant, all of her power was stripped away by a monstrous force that achieved nothing but destruction. It's not uncommon for rape victims to blame themselves for what happened, at least partially, and in a case like Ellen, the fact that she managed to conquer everything else in her life might make it more difficult to accept that something so horrible could happen to her. In that way, Ellen is perhaps the most sympathetic character, because hers is not a story of redemption, but rather of moving past trauma and agony. When Am ridicules her for being a quote-unquote hysterical woman and reminding her of the pain she suffered, it hits differently because Ellen hasn't done anything wrong, she was merely the victim of a horrific crime. It's oddly prescient how much of Ellen's story rings true today, with the concept of victim shaming slash blaming feeling especially relevant because it's unfortunately still a part of our reality. Having said all that, I don't think Ellen's story works well as a rape story, not because of the content, but because of the limitations of working within the video game genre. Several technical aspects required to make I Have No Mouth work as a video game prohibits Ellen's backstory from fully hitting the mark. Ellen's personality and attitude continuously shifts back and forth between confident and sassy and panicked and frightened, especially when you trigger an optional line by, for example, trying to pick up something that Ellen can't take with her. I understand that rape victims, and victims of trauma in general, can experience this as well, and I don't mean to imply that every single victim needs to be despondent over a tragic event and nothing else. But in Ellen's case, it's not a natural personality shift, feeling more like a product of limited resources to create dialogue for her character. Not helping is Ellen's slightly exaggerated black American accent that may or may not be stereotypical, I'm not knowledgeable enough to tell. You'll never get laid with that line of stuff, Anubis. Take care of your own boring self. Bye now. I do believe that rape can be discussed at length in a tasteful, intelligent, and thought-provoking manner through video games, and I commend Cyber Dreams for their attempt. But it falls short of being a profound portrayal of sexual assault and how it affects its victims, and unlike Gorister's story where the shortcomings are easy to laugh at, this feels much more like a missed opportunity. You ain't got no choice, Ellen girl. It's got to be the way. The physically and mentally manipulated Benny, whom Am is warped into, as he puts it, the hideous countenance of an ape thing, finds himself in a prehistoric village whose inhabitants worship Am with sacrifices. While Am restores some of Benny's mental facilities to let him think clearly, he also cripples Benny further physically to increase his pain. Am, you son of a bitch. You've cleared my mind but crippled my legs. I can barely walk. Am sends Benny to this village to find some food, but Am has rigged everything edible to make Benny sick, forcing him to cough up blood. Finding himself an outcast as he can't communicate verbally with the rest of the villagers, Benny ingratiates himself into a family of a woman and her deformed son, who not only help him find a way to gain sustenance, but also to rediscover his long-lost compassion. Benny's character was changed the most from the short story, as while the others merely had additional details added to their arcs, Benny's backstory has been changed entirely. In the short story, he previously was a gay scientist who had his sexual orientation stripped away from him in addition to being physically and mentally mutilated, and his frail mind is only concerned about finding food. 
In the game, Benny is a former soldier known for his ruthless command and refusal to tolerate those he deemed as weak. To me, this feels like a lost opportunity to address the issues that gay people, and by extension the LGBTQ plus community, face, especially because Cyber Dreams came close to delivering a solid story about sexual assault with Ellen's scenario. David Sears stated that at one point, the team was going to keep Benny's sexuality intact from the short story, but discarded that plot thread at some point, and David Mullick even called this a missed opportunity. It probably would have fallen prey to the same technical limitations, but the potential was there and would have been more interesting than what we got. What we do get is a backstory that's lazily handled, as Benny's former life as a soldier is undercooked, and all of it is confined to one screen. During the Vietnam War, Benny murdered one of his soldiers, Private Brickman, for not measuring up to his standards as a commander, then had the witnesses to his actions killed to cover it up. The graves of his soldiers are located outside the village, and their spirits chastise Benny for not having compassion after he allows the mutant boy's mother to be sacrificed. It's only by stopping the sacrifice from taking place and planting flowers on Brickman's grave that Benny shows how much he's changed and redeems himself for what he did to the soldiers. We know nothing about the soldiers except that they died, and Benny's quest to redeem himself doesn't feel connected to anything. It just detracts from the story of Benny learning how to feel compassion through the mutant boy, which sucks because that part is pretty good. When the story begins, all he's concerned about is food, as he frequently mentions being hungry and often remembers various foods when examining objects and places, but in order to eat without relying on the boy's mother, the player will need to perform vile and disgusting actions. You can eat the flesh of the dead soldiers and ask to eat either the mother or the boy when they're about to be sacrificed, and Benny was originally going to be able to eat a live baby, though this was removed at some point. It's evident from the sheer horror every food source brings that the game wants you to ignore Benny's hunger and focus on changing his behavior. The boy is the only one in the village that Benny can communicate with thanks to the boy's manipulation of a video screen. As with every other character, Benny can only talk in whines and growls like an animal. Thus, the boy is the only one who imparts a sense of morality onto Benny, who slowly begins to change his ways by helping the boy hide from the rest of the village when they target him for sacrifice. There are things to admire about Benny's scenario, but thanks to a botched backstory, it doesn't reach its full potential and it left me wanting more. Nimdok's scenario is also difficult to talk about because it tackles one of the most devastating and merciless events in human history. The game makes it immediately clear that Nimdok is a former Nazi who served as one of their top scientists during World War II. However, he has since become a withered old man whose failing memory prevents him from realizing and acknowledging his wrongdoings, which becomes a convenient shield to deflect blame and guilt away from himself. Am sends Nimdok to a Nazi concentration camp to find the Lost Tribe, which will allow him to continue his research and experiments. We know that means the atrocities committed by Nazi scientists, but Nimdok's fading memory prohibits him from understanding the reality of his environment when the psychodrama begins. I have not seen so many corpses since... Ugh, my memory is not what it used to be. Nimdok reunites with Dr. Joseph Mengele, his superior during the war, and a historical figure notorious for performing human experimentation under Nazi rule, who also wants Nimdok to continue his work. However, as the nature of his past and current location becomes clearer to him, Nimdok begins to make amends for the destruction he has caused by assisting some Jewish prisoners in escaping from the camp. Out of all the scenarios in the game, Nimdok's piqued my interest the most because I was curious to see how well it treated its subject matter, and I found it to be a surprisingly deep examination of Nazism. It focuses on the emotional and moral quandaries that go beyond the reign of the Nazi party, specifically whether or not a Nazi can be redeemed. This game is all about the characters finding the strength to make up for their past mistakes, but Nimdox is the most compelling because it is much more ambiguous about how it presents its main character. With the others, you can make them do horrible things, but the only way to proceed requires that you commit to the morally sound ending, but Nimdox is the only scenario you can complete legitimately by failing. After the prisoners begin an uprising, they allow Nimdok to get a head start in running away before they chase after him thanks to his Jewish heritage. 
Nimdok heads to a Nazi research facility where he finds the Golem, a creature from Jewish mythology, and brings it to life, simultaneously remembering that he turned his own Jewish parents over to the Nazis during the war. From here, the player can either hand control of the Golem over to the Jewish prisoners, which acts as an admission of his crimes, or kill the prisoners, leading to Nimdok deciding to continue his research. Either way, Nimdok's scenario is marked as completed, but if you decide not to redeem Nimdok, he will not be playable during the endgame. Despite what online discourse about I Have No Mouth says, this does not make the best ending for the game unattainable, it just makes it more difficult, and even the French and German versions, which as a reminder, omit Nimdok's story, still allow you to win the game. Am even goads you into going down this route when you begin Nimdok's scenario, but unlike the other characters whom he's merely taunting, this time the computer is extending a real chance for Nimdok to step back into his old shoes and continue down a dark road. And I find that interesting, since it actually follows through on the original premise of the game where you could go down the evil path if you so chose, which is absent from the other narratives. The fact that Nimdok can completely abandon the right pathway makes the moral decision making all the more powerful. Without the possibility of doing horrible actions, being a nice person has no meaning. In other words, we can only value good if we understand what evil is and what its consequences are. Nazism is a well-defined evil that makes it easy for the player to identify the right choices, but the game knows that some people will be tempted to go down that path either out of curiosity or differing morals. But if you stick with the ethical route and attempt to redeem Nemdok, you'll find a narrative that makes an honest attempt at humanizing its protagonist despite his crimes against humanity. Nemdok is referred to as a butcher by his Nazi comrades and the prisoners, having gained legendary status during the war. Thanks to his memory loss, however, Nimdok can disassociate himself from the Nazis and view them from an outsider's perspective. During the war, Nimdok believed wholeheartedly in Nazi propaganda and dedicated his attention to their cause, even at the cost of selling out his friends and family to them. Now he can see the murder and brutality on display from an external perspective. Not necessarily a victim's perspective, but one that's still removed from the dogma he once believed in. It's this that ultimately enables him to confront his past and rebel against those who want him to return to his evil ways. He can admit his guilt and work towards a brighter future, but we know that he must have some temptation to fall back in line with his former allies. I Have No Mouth raises the questions of whether or not these characters can redeem themselves or be forgiven, and nowhere is that more difficult to answer than Nimdok's story. I don't think the game necessarily wants to answer these questions, so it's ultimately up to the player to make that decision. Nimdok cannot completely make amends with his past by the end of the game because of the sheer scope of what he's done, but he pushes away from his past and sets himself on the road to redemption and forgiveness. And that, above all else, has to be admired. Dr. Nimdok, you are unredeemable after all. Come, let us continue our research. Finally, we come to Ted, the protagonist of the short story who, in the game, was previously a con artist and ladies man and is now paranoid about the others discovering his secrets. Am delivers Ted to the Room of Dark, where he promises to set Ted free if he solves the puzzle within, but all this does is send him to a medieval castle where his real trials await him. In the castle, Ted finds Ellen, whom Ted is in love with, dying from an unknown illness brought on by her evil stepmother, an ugly witch who plans to sacrifice Ellen's soul to summon a demon. Ellen desires to look at her reflection in the mirror before passing away, leading Ted to search all around the castle while encountering several inhabitants and mythological beings to find it. So, excuse me for being blunt, but Ted's psychodrama is flat out boring. It has the least exciting setting, the least compelling side characters, and especially the least interesting protagonist. In the original story, Ted suffered from paranoia and neurosis, which made him unable to trust the others and believe that they secretly hated him. Since Ted doesn't interact with the others in this game, except for his fantasy version of Ellen, there's rarely any indication that Ted even is paranoid, and the dialogue that does reference it feels tacked on at best. Instead, we get a snobby douchebag of a character whose witty repartee gets old incredibly quick, and it isn't even enjoyable to make fun of either. <laughs> so typical of the castles I've visited in Europe. A beautiful facade disguising ordinary stone. Uh, appearance is everything. 
The personal stakes seem much lower here, since Ted isn't trying to make up for his paranoia or anything that happened in his past, but instead appears to be accounting for his sins in the present. Ted is in love with Ellen, but apparently never told her this, and if his psychodrama is anything to go by, he views himself as Ellen's knight in shining armor who will always rescue her from danger. But we have no reason to believe that these feelings are true love since Ted has been bottling them up for so long, potentially over a century, that his idea of love has become twisted and corrupted over time. He's lost sight of what actual love between human beings is and has instead fallen back on both his past as a Casanova and his love for classic literature, which both may have painted a false view of love in his head. In this scenario, Ted is in a position of power where he is the only person who can save Ellen, as her father is not returned from a quest to find a cure for her illness and almost everyone else in the castle is against her. But the player can also betray Ted's love for Ellen by sleeping with another woman in the castle to gain information and even sell Ellen's soul to the demon Surgot in exchange for opening a portal to the surface world. That'd be interesting if Ted had a more developed backstory, but all we get are vague mentions that he was a con man who manipulated women for his benefit, and they're not enough to make him all that memorable. It'd be easier to swallow if the other characters and the dialogue in Ted's story were better, but sadly, they're not very enjoyable either. They don't have many traits or quirks that make them enjoyable to talk to or talk about, and the dialogue is often at the game's worst here. Unlike the other scenarios, which feature provocative scenes that raise questions without answering them, Ted's psychodrama stays at a constant dull and humdrum pace without bringing in anything clever or new. It's so boring that I have very little to say about it, as its story doesn't make for an interesting conversation, so let's talk about something different. Did you know that you can beat Ted's scenario by getting eaten by wolves? Yep, the forests surrounding the castle are filled with wolves, and at a certain point in the story, a pack of them will come to the castle entrance. To stop them from getting inside, you're supposed to barricade the front door with knight's armor, but if you aren't able to do it in time, a wolf will come in through the door and maul Ted to death. This is supposed to be a game over, but for whatever reason, the game treats it as a successful ending, and Ted will move on to the end game. And I'll be honest, I think this is the better way to play Ted's scenario because it's quicker and, like I've said, his story is otherwise so tiresome. At least with this glitch, we have the satisfaction of seeing Ted die without dealing with the melodramatic sell your soul to the devil story. But even though we've redeemed four humans and watched one of them be eaten, the game isn't over as it's now time for us to get our revenge on Am. Once all five humans have completed their psychodramas, two voices suddenly reach out to them and ask for their assistance. They are the Russian Am and the Chinese Am, the remnants of the Russian and Chinese computers that Am absorbed when he gained sentience. The two have been meddling with the psychodramas, making it possible for the humans to avoid being tortured and overcome their fatal flaw. Since all five redeemed themselves, Am retreats inside himself to figure out where he went wrong, allowing the humans to enter Am and destroy him with the help of the Russian and Chinese computers. The Russian and Chinese convert the humans into binary code and send them to Am's brainscape in cyberspace, a psychedelic combination of a human brain, robotic parts, and broken glass. In order to defeat Am, the humans must deal with his servant Surgot and help the Russian and Chinese destroy Am's main brain components, which take the form of the Freudian concepts of the id, the ego, and the superego. From this point, the character's spiritual barometers become their health bars, as several actions in the endgame will shock them and bring them closer to death, and if a character dies here, they're gone for good. Some of the items from the previous segments return to your inventory here as totems that represent a particular idea, such as love, forgiveness, compassion, entropy, and clarity. There are actual items you can pick up as well, but these aren't strictly needed even if you want to get the best ending. More on that in a bit. Once they dispatch Surgot, the Russian and Chinese instruct the player to wake up Am's ego and destroy it, which will allow the two to gain control over Am and supposedly stop his rampage. However, determining who you can trust isn't easy, as Surgot tells the protagonist about a colony of 750 humans currently in cryogenic sleep on the moon, but the Russian and Chinese claim that these humans are dead. It's at this point that the story breaks off into several different endings depending on your actions. The endings fall under three categories, the Am is destroyed ending, the Am is partially destroyed ending, and the Am wins endings. 
The worst ending can be triggered by A. Listening to the Russian and Chinese Am and disabling only Am's ego. B. Eliminating the Russian and Chinese Am without fully destroying him. C. Giving the Totem of Entropy to Sir God so he can destroy the Russian and Chinese Ams. D. Giving Am and his Russian and Chinese counterparts supreme power. Or E. Bringing all five characters' health down to zero. This results in the humans dying except for the last one you controlled, whom Am turns into a jelly-like creature as he does in the original story, and the human is forced to live the rest of their life as Am's eternal punishment for defying him, and with that, the game solemnly ends. To see the other endings though, you're going to have to disable Am's id, ego, and super ego by delivering outcomes that they weren't expecting through the use of the totems. If you aren't familiar with the concept of the id, ego, and superego, they're hypothetical ways to describe the three fundamental aspects of the human psyche as it develops over the early stages of a human's life. The id is a human's instinct and pleasure drive, which focuses on what a person wants, and Am's id acts as the impulsive force that makes him enjoy torturing humans, even as he feels suffering for having so much power at his disposal and not being able to do much with it. Showing compassion to the id makes it realize that its pain is greater than the human's, and it shuts itself off. The ego is a human's logic functions that attempts to bridge the id's desires with reality, so Am's ego is responsible for designing the various torture methods to satisfy the id. The humans show forgiveness to the ego, which causes it to question the logic of its torture subjects, refuse to accept its conclusions, and shut down. Finally, the superego is a human's conscience and awareness of why things should or shouldn't happen, represented in Am by a being that ponders long-term goals rather than merely tapping into its own pleasure center. Giving Am superego the clarity to understand the futility of its actions, however, makes it realize how pointless it is to continue, and with that, the last brain component is down. If the humans disable some of Am's components, but not all of them, again, except for just disabling the ego, the Russian and Chinese entities chastise you for disobeying, and destroying them sends you to the Am is partially destroyed ending. In this ending, Am is powered down, but in his last moments, he terminates the life functions of the humans on the moon, killing them and preventing them from repopulating the Earth. The last human alive becomes a watchdog who keeps the machines in check, though they regret the demise of the human colony. However, by disabling all of the components, the player can see the best ending where Am's structures are destroyed, the human colony survives, and the machines begin terraforming the Earth. None of the endings bring much closure to anything, which is by design, as the point of the endgame wasn't to be a wholly satisfying conclusion, but rather allow the player to have some sense of finality to Am's tortures. It works as an ending to Am, explicitly dealing with the concept of entropy and how, despite his power, Am can't create anything, only destroy. That limitation on his power means that he needs to be careful not to destroy the humans, which is possible thanks to Nimdok's research in creating an eternal life serum and morphogenics, which allows him to physically alter humans without killing them. When Am retreats inside himself, he unwittingly enables the humans the opportunity to strike at him and free themselves from their tortures, leading to his inevitable destruction. However, it's less effective as a conclusion to the characters, especially since their stories are already wrapped up in their psychodramas. Another part of the endgame is disabling all of the power nodes, which allegedly weakens Am and allows the humans to continue their attack. Every character has their own power node, which requires them to use the lessons they've learned and the tokens they've gained to deactivate them. But here's the thing, you don't have to do anything with these power nodes. They are absolutely useless and serve no purpose to the game, and ignoring them completely does not preclude you from the best ending. All that matters is disabling the id, ego, and superego. Perhaps this was a holdover from the early stages of development, as it just pads the game out in its current state, but could have been so much more. And honestly, that's the best way I can describe most of this game. It could have been so much more. Even disregarding its gameplay faults, which mostly result from it being of a different era, the story just doesn't match Ellison's original vision. It fleshes out details that weren't originally addressed, but it does so with storylines that aren't fully developed, are contradictory to the game's themes, or just plain suck. Which is a shame, because there are genuinely good elements, such as the impressive-for-their-time aesthetics and mature exploration of dark themes. Even though the game is 25 years old, there's not much in its examination of adult concepts that feels outdated, and most of it is done fairly tastefully. But for every step it takes forward in delivering a dark, depressing, and messed up experience, it also takes many steps backward. 
It never goes far enough in addressing complicated issues to make it a successful piece of representation, and while it does a decent job as an introduction of its themes, that's unfortunately all it amounts to. The thing is, I don't know if I of No Mouth could have had a better video game adaptation, as the story doesn't lend itself to a longer art form like video games without a significant reworking or expansion. Setting aside its problems, it holds up well enough to be discussed even if it isn't that fun to play anymore because of its antiquated game design. It may be a game that's better to watch than it is to play, though if you do want to play it yourself, it is available on modern computers via GOG.com and Steam, as well as on iOS and Android. Just be prepared to deal with some deeply disturbing imagery and themes, because despite how old and obsolete it may seem on the surface, it's absolutely not for the faint of heart, even if it is sometimes a little silly. This is not over. 